Brothers and sisters, I've been sent here today to ask you a question. Who are you? Who are you, black brother? Who are you, black sister? Don't worry, I'm here to tell you. The story of black people in Britain stretches back centuries, although the most recent migration to the UK took place in the 40s, 50s and 60s, mainly from Africa and the Caribbean. Arriving in the UK from various colonies, identity labels such as Negro, Black and Coloured were all used to classify and distinguish various non-white people with Black still in use today. What is Blackness? What does it mean to be Black in Britain. Do you know what it means to be black in Britain? Do you? She doesn't know. After I'm eradicated, I will then be crucified on television screens and smartphones all around the world. Line followers will seem the worst, as the truth of my very execution is circulated on social media streets, only to be invaded by the establishment, who will plague my Facebook and Instagram accounts. Find that one photo that one quote, that one status update, I saw unvoiced proof as to why I was killed. I became black when his story compared my curly hair to the cornfields my ancestors were accustomed to. I became black when my peers decided a red skin complexion was an infection. No one understands the rejection. I became black when Jay and Jigger said it was okay to call me a nigger. That shit trick. That shit trick. That shit trick. I became black when women branded me an Oreo. Coconut. Bounty. Black on the outside, white on the inside. I will not allow labels to define my inside. I wear my choices for pride. I became black when I moved to the hood, the slum, the East End, where mothers use their sons. I became black when welfare stereotypes labeled me a thug. So many of time before they hunt me down the slugs. I became black when my colour became a case. Probably why the police continue to abuse their place. Our fights, our battles, all a part of my race. I became black when I didn't have a European name. Stephen Lawrence, Zell Ronnie, Cherry Grove, Mark Bishop. There's so many of that I can't even remember. Sean Riggs, Christopher Alder, Mark Duggan. Alien act. According to the media, we are to blame. Black power, black politics, black oppression, black panthers, black lives matter. I can't tell you what it means to be black, but I can tell you what it means to be me. Racial classification is a social construct and has its roots in slavery. In the 19th century, labels such as Afro-Saxon, Anglo-African, coloured, free people of colour were all in use. Coloured, Negro and Black were all established terms used for enslaved Blacks during colonial times. These Variations in racial labels represent a change in acceptance of these terms, not the creation of new labels. So what's the significance of these terms today? How does that impact one's identity or sense of self? How does it impact your identity or sense of self? 
she doesn't have a clue. Who has a clue? Can someone tell me, please? I feel like we get really caught up in the semantics and the words and in our community. And so we did, it detracts from us being able to come together. I think I look at black as a political term. Okay. Um, and whether we have chosen that word or not, my, my thing is the word is there and it's a way to really clarify exactly who we're talking about in, um, in terms of our political identity. Um, and if we are striving towards political change, then I think it's a necessary term to be used. The use of the term black in the past was negative because uh, it was used by the enslavers to um, downgrade the identity of African peoples. Um, so now um, the use of the term black since the, the Renaissance in the US in the 60s um, in the black power movement was to give us, give power to the term black rather than negativity. The idea of black identity has come out of um, political response to racism. Yeah, the whole area of this concept has come from racism. But we've tried to make good of it. I say, no, we're going to see black as good. I've done a music that I'm not feared to be black, you know, and right now a lot of people there, they like to see things in a different way, you understand? But it's, 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 far, it's part of our identity, you understand, you know? Malcolm X said there was a time, there was a time when, they, when the slave identified themselves with the slave master. Mm -hmm. You know, say, this is 20, 2016, mm -hmm. and any black man, African, identify themselves with the slave master is mentally sick. Mm -hmm. You understand, you know, and we have to really realize that our philosophy, our psychology, all of them things they have to come from our cultural aspect. You understand? Those are things that shape our identity. So if I see myself as an African, that's the identity that I have to walk around with. Just thinking about how colour code has been used across the world. If you think about Indian people, they were labelled by Europeans as brown people. Um, you had Chinese people who were labelled as yellow people. Uh, Amerindians were labelled as red people. And, and what's happened is that one by one, all these separate groups, apart from the Amerindians who were wiped off the face of the earth, so only a few remaining survivors, uh, kind of lock, let go of those labels. They didn't actually help them. They didn't help them to understand who they were, where they were, because of course there's no country like Blackistan. I mean, there's no such place that we can kind of link to. So with Indian people, they don't tend to refer to themselves as brown people anymore. It's only a few of them. Same thing like, you know, you'd never hear a European called a Chinese person, a yellow person. But with the situation with African people, the label black is still in usage. And part of that is because we have actually embraced it. Uh, and I'd say definitely wrongly. Uh, I'm not opposed to using the term black. And at times I do use the term black, but I, I do not feel that it is a term that is sufficient by itself. Because blackness, has a deep history, a long history, going back to peoples on the continent of Africa. We know that the peoples of the land known as Egypt today, which we call Kemet, they called themselves black people. And there are many other indigenous African nationalities that still exist today, where they, if you translate in their indigenous languages black, then that's how the people describe themselves. However, um, in a diaspora context, blackness can never be sufficient. Um, black has become an all-encompassing term to cover people from the African diaspora. Even though those of us are, who may be born in the Caribbean, in the USA, over here in, in England or in the rest of Europe, we all ascribe to this word black even though we're all from Africa, we don't find ourselves as happy to uh, associate ourselves with the continent. So there clearly is a disconnect that we're using black as our accepted identity rather than using the term African. It gave me the understanding of what John Henry Clark said in terms of how all people identify themselves with a land, a history and a culture. And so black, therefore, wasn't a sufficient term
but I didn't I, to, in terms of defining my identity. But um, but at the same time, I also understood that when we said black, when we used the word black in Africa, in the Caribbean, or wherever we were, in even even on the continent, if you talk about uh, Fela and Nicola Pocuti referring to himself as the black president, you know, what I'm saying them kind of things there. We, we we weren't just using it as a descriptive term. It it it, it referred to uh, a history of culture and, and an experience, and that was African. Like, I've never really had a problem with it, but I, like I say, I have seen the levels within the culture being called Black Attack, uh, Midnight. So I've seen like how as as only as I got older, I realized that the, the strength the, the word black can carry strength. But as a child growing up, I was looking up to white people, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't know the power of the word black, so to speak, as a child. It's only as I got uh, older and I started to read and understand my culture mm -hmm. is when black power and, you know, the Afros and, you know, the movement in America, the Panthers, is when they took the word and made it a powerful word, so to yeah. speak, you know? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But me growing up in the UK, you, I didn't hear nothing about no, oh, you're black, that's it. I don't have an issue with it as a, as like, you know, um, to an extent where people would want to um, say like, we shouldn't be called black. But I do feel that it's more of identity to be called African than black. Because um, black is, is non-descriptive. All it is is a description of a color or a shade. And even then, um, if you're being literal, then black is the the darkest shade, and we're we're not all that. So so many other important issues within the black community to focus on. I never get offended if anyone calls me black. I mean, I always I've always referred to myself as African from day one. Um, but yeah, I, there's no offence to me when it, when anyone calls me black, whether they're Indian, black themselves, yeah. why it just doesn't it just isn't a thing just because there are better things to focus on. And also, I feel like where um, black people are just on so many different parts, um, living in so many different parts of the world, black is also a term that could also unify us yeah. as well. I think we are outgrowing the term black. Um, I understand its political relevance, but I think we are outgrowing the term. I think um, even where my, my journey, my family's journey went to Dominique and Saint Lucia, but the reality is that we can, it's an education. So we all understand that we are from the African continent and we all know to see that as our source or our motherland and it's more than a term, it's, it's you're attached to um, a people and a culture which where wherever we are, we are we are African, if you get what I'm saying. So I think we're outgrowing it um, the same way black came into existence because it was necessary, because we had that brown colour, the Negro, yeah. I think we're at a stage where we're outgrowing black, I think. And especially as, technically, anyone can become black at this point in time. Tate, Tate Library, fucking up for my blackness, that building was built through slavery. You understand? Sugar, sugar. You understand what I'm saying? I am so proud that they put that, the Black Cultural Archives, in the centre of Windsor Square. This used to be called Jurassic Park, where all the old indigenous black people who paved the way for us to be making these films today, even though they might be out here drinking, we are allowed to be here today because of them, them, the old people, you understand? And they put the Black Cultural Archives in the Yasso, Brixton, not Hansen, not Nisa. Brixton. Let's keep it real. Just saying. Hashtag. My skin is like ink. Taste in pens only held by the hand of God himself that drips like ebony along spines of ancient books and dances along the pages of eternity. Do you see it? Do you see it? Some choose to call it black. A term that holds more mystery than actual identity. Some, some call it ghetto. For entertainment shows, far too many minstrel shows, and you are actually aware of some, even choose to call it nigger. Bonami, the I, I call it majesty. 
For my king thought about the dark side of the moon when he birthed me into existence. Royal lineage mark up. It's richness in my skin. Do you see it? Do you see it? Catherine. Catherine, don't let me call your name again. Makeda. Who? Mother, my name is Makeda. Catherine Kristin is such a beautiful name. Why don't you like that name? How many times do we have to go through this? This is the first time. This is not the first time. And I doubt it will be the last time, but you need to stop. Your name is Catherine, named after your grandmother. Granny was an amazing woman. And stubborn, just <laughs> like you. I am not saying that the name is not good enough. I am saying that I have changed it. I just need you to respect my request. Respect your request? What the hell are you talking about? What small-minded man of a fool has corrupted your mind? I didn't go through nine hours of labour, wiping your ass, sending you to one of the top schools in London, just for you to change your name to Mavika. Makeda. Well, I'll call you by your birth name, Catherine. <sighs> it's just being in this country, we have lost a sense of who we are as people. I am just reconnecting with my culture, you know, my ancestral roots. What are you doing? What are you talking about? You're British. You were born British. You have Jamaican heritage. Your roots are Jamaican. Get in touch with your roots. Uh, Jamaicans are descended of enslaved Africans. Our ancestors, all of that, is who we are as people. And to deny that is to deny yourself. Deny myself? Don't you dare. My generation came here to pave a way for you and your future generation so that you could have a voice. Mom. Don't you dare tell me about my heritage when it's staring you right in your face. <laughs> One of the main things that people started to do in terms of becoming African-centered or coming into African consciousness was reclaim African name. Through our experience of, of what we call the Ma'afa or um, enslavement, colonization and invasion, um, we were given European names, yeah? And some people thought it was sufficient um, to either to just reclaim an African family name because the European gave us his surname to say that he was the sir, yeah, he was the master, we were his property. Um, my dad always said that, nah, the, the, the surname signified that we were his property for him. But the, the, the first name, the Christ, they, they also gave us Christian names to symbolize the fact that we were benighted barbarians, yeah, saved by Christian grace. And so if we, our, our names, our names therefore were considered barbaric. Uh, savage because our culture was and so it's important that we reclaim both and we throw away European names altogether. But in saying that 
I still maintain Stanford because when I started researching the name, and obviously that name came from my father. My parents were married when they had me and I took my father's name, which is not his name. And I discovered, I did a bit of research about slavery in Barbados, and I know that the name comes from different places in the UK, but most likely Norfolk, yes? So it's not our name. But through all of that, and keeping the name, I discovered that the name Stanford is actually patented, it's trademarked, yes? And that you cannot use that name any old house. Stanford University have trademarked it. And when I discovered that, I thought, okay, maybe I'll hang on to this name a bit more. Why? Because identity and the search for my people, wherever they are, whoever they are, has been something I've had in me since I was a child. I've always had this thing that oh, I've got family out there who are looking for me, who don't know I exist because the only way we can actually search for each other is through these names that we were given. And so I decided to keep it because I hadn't gone far enough in my journey to actually finding out who I was and who my family were. And so it performed a strategic role for me. And as a reparationist, it was also part of the evidence base yeah. of the damage. The damage of the Ma'angamizi, the key Swahili term for African Holocaust and continuum of chattel colonial or neo-colonial forms of enslavement resulting in genocide and ecocide and the destruction of our communities. And that is really key because this thing about who we are, who our people are, what our names are, what our true ethnicity is, is something that has been buried, hidden, some of it has been destroyed to the point where we can never regain it. It's not their fault. It's not the young people's fault. Because we all, you, you, you know, if you remember when you were young like them, you know, a lot of us, if a 14 year old come in front of you, try and remember what you were doing when you were 14. You know, because we all have this urgency, but sometimes we don't know that, we don't know that, we do not know that there's a bridge gone, or, gone down around the corner. What I'm saying is, if a, if a black youth don't know his identity, then you have to go look on his parents. Because they come from somewhere. And most of the biggest problem that we, we have right now is not with the youths, it's with our own peer group. You understand? And if we, you see, what I find out that there's a saying that said, when children do anything, adults shout. But when adults do anything, they whisper because we're afraid for to tell the friends that we are talking is rubbish. So it's we confuse the youth, you understand? And until we start to put provision in, and we start to um, invest in our youth, then we can't complain if other people invest in them. If Michael go away and come back as Michelle, a fool with fault. 70 years after the Rinwash, subsequent generations have a strong sense of being black British. From, this comes from the lived experience and progress within the UK. But how authentic is black British identity? Where does it stem from? What are its roots? No? No. I think that black British culture stroke identity, which I believe are very closely intertwined, is something that is quite, for me, I don't know if it's something that is natural. And I, I think that's probably the reason why I believe, I, I don't really believe in black British culture because it's not something that I believe if we had been left in that to our natural state, even had we traveled, traveled the globe and all the rest of it, I still don't believe that we would be where we are now and be behaving the way that we are now. A lot of these things are influenced by capitalism, by consumerism, by all of these things, do you know what I mean? So for me, black British culture is just an extension of a culture, again, that they've given to us that we've had to negotiate ourselves within. I still feel like there very much is black British culture and I feel like I have filled as much British as I do black. Because when I go to my country, I'm in the year, <clears throat> but when I go to Grenada, they separate me as yeah. English. <laughs> you know, not even British, English. 
And I had to, as a child, you know, as a child now, but again, I was a teenager, I had to recognize that there were differences in between the way that I behaved compared to how, you know, I would people behave. And I think I, at first, felt like it was a negative thing, but I've, I've come to learn to embrace that. I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling British. I know there's a lot of negative, negative things about Britain, but I think I have been brought up here, so like by without choice, I have adapted some of the culture. You know, it is a part of my character, and um, so I think to exclude that, yes, you can say that we are an extension of African and Caribbean culture, but I do think that I'm different to a Caribbean person who's been brought up in America or a Caribbean person who's been brought up in Sweden or wherever. So for that reason, I think that there is black, black British. Like English, if that, because Britain, that's an empire, you know, the very same that enslaved us. So to consider yourself British, you really have to look at it from that context and where Britain comes from. And that is of an oppressor of this empire. So to be British is to be part of that. And if you know of this, then consciously. So I would definitely say there is a black British um, like, um, culture. There's an assimilated culture. There's an integrated culture. But that's the same as the Europeans um, that are here. You know? so, I kind of identify with um, being sort of British black. And again, that term British has a lot of connotations about it, especially now with Brexit and everything. But it's a big part of my life. And there was a time when I rejected that part of my life. I just thought that actually I didn't really want to identify with that bit because that was the, no, the, yeah, the British bit because that was the, that was the oppressor. And I didn't want to, that to be part of my identity. But the more I thought about my internal world and who I am as a person and thinking about who I am, I couldn't really deny that that part, that part is, you know, a big part of me. I, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a part of me. And for me to deny that part of me is like denying a big chunk of who I am. Between 1990, before 1990, if you said there's such thing as a British black culture, I'd have probably said no. Until we started to see people like Loose Ends, Soul to Soul, um, maybe Brand New Heavies, Incognito, those sort of, you know, Karen Wheeler, those sort of um, groups who were coming out as proud of their African heritage. And at the same time, there was a Britishness to them that I could actually associate with. But for the first time, I did actually see that. At the time, I thought this was a positive thing. Now, looking back, I think that what it has allowed is for some people to, again, have another way in which they can separate themselves from their African roots, which um, that, that level of disconnect is always a problem. With ourselves, we haven't been passed down much, especially uh, in terms of Africa or African traditions. We've, been, we've attached ourselves mostly to American. So this identification with the streets, for example, the roads, the hood, like that comes from us watching American TV and seeing, ah, oh, this is how black people behave. Therefore, this is who I am. Is that the question of identity is now up in the air again. We, we're, we're not sure who we are again. We're defining ourselves according to a, a lot of different things again and more and more we're simply defining ourselves as British. They have statistics out there today that suggest that the majority, some 70 something percent is the last thing I, I remember hearing, uh, of young black people in this country identify as British, which wasn't the same for our, uh, our parent generation even if they weren't necessarily hardcore involved in anything black power, it was a sensibility of, now nah, I'm not British, I'm black, or I'm West Indian, or I'm Caribbean, or I'm African, yeah? Um, and that, that is the symbolic of the fact that we understand that British, to say British means that you identify with a history and a culture that's not really yours. Mm. And so if, we're, if, if our young people now are identifying with British, and Britain is the culture, British is the culture that oppresses their own culture, 
that there's, there's an implication there, there's an oppressive... Identity is not only what we claim for ourselves. Identities get shaped and imposed by the state through social policy. And what we've been seeing, I'd say, in the last 10 years is this attempt to, uh, you know, classify us as minorities. So they'd use the term BME, uh, Black Minority Ethnic, or BAMER, Black Minority Ethnic and Refugee, or BAME, Black Asian and Minority Ethnic. And there's all these acronyms, which now you often hear our own people using. Oh, when they were well, BME communities, and I always challenge people and I say, who are you talking about? What's a BME community? What's a BME perspective? You know, that is still a imperialistic, hegemonistic um, imposition and gaze and lens of whiteness that actually refuses to see our distinctions and our diversity, which is what make us all so human. Because lots of black people don't know the true history. Then they might run around like they're going to turn like an Englishman. You understand? Because when our parents come here, they know who they were. You understand? No matter if they never have the full nine yard, but they know who they are. Mm -hmm. And they know the terrain that they come and, and encounter. You know, and they adjust themselves to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Here we are, 2016, and the children of those people, those people who come here to snow, I mean, I thought nasty snow and teddy boy and all of them things there. Work hard to send them into school to get a better education, to help the race. And these sellout children, they go and they help Barclays Bank, they help all the other rest of wise institutions, and they don't even set up a chicken coop to help their parents. So I'm saying, not so the majority, but a lot of the professional blacks in this country don't know their identity. And it proved the other day during the referendum. The energy that they have, both, both they in or they out. Yeah. And now the European having them shaking it all about. <laughs> I am that burden carrier, that ancient warrior, that weightlifter, that shapeshifter, that don't mess with me, Mr. Sister. That different picture, that loaded shopping trolley, that girl without her favourite dolly, that donkey back wonky but still more laughs than Dom Jolly. I am that love giver, that sugar deliverer, full slice, not small sliver, though her pay packet's thinner, that heart wrenching, soul quenching, would donate my liver, that fool who buy you stuff you don't deserve and still get pushed to the curb. That bird, absurd as it seems, chirping in trees, singing to be free from twigs, sticks and leaves. I am that mind wanderer who might want to ponder on things way beyond her, that information swallower, that knowledge follower, that tosser on that midnight trip to cost cutter for one thing or another, not heeding warnings from her mother as she's still waiting to discover. I am that old soul, that crease in the fold, that brazen and bold, no I don't fit the mould, slightly out of control, mind impenetrable to the lies it's been told, I'm that bend in the bowl, I am that principle, that purpose, that could be of service, that deep below the surface, deep down where the dirt is, that memory, that energy of a long forgotten people, the fist that was raised in a fight to be equal, the drop of blood spilt from the veins of a nation that once nurtured and cradled our civilization. I am what I am and no other image. So don't put me in your boxes when your structures are too rigid. I am the plant that blossomed from roots of great vision. I am the joy in the laughter of my West African father. I am the beat in the djembe as the rhythm gets faster. I am the bright colored beads bought at Jankara Market. I am the voice of my grandma just before she departed. I am that I am, that I am is a blessing. From the house that I live in to the items collected, the gifts received, not just material stream of wisdom retrieved from ethereal dreams. And I love what I am, what I am, what I am. And I follow a path some just don't understand, but I know in my path, it's the almighty's plan so i am yes i am yes i am 
Ay! <laughs> <laughs> After tonight, her life will never be the same again. What time are we meeting the rest? 10.30 p.m. So that gives us four hours to drink as much as we can. <laughs> I'll yeah. drink to that. <laughs> Listen, ladies, I just want to say thank you so much for coming today and spending the last night of me being a single lady. Oh, oh we're so glad to be here. We wouldn't be anywhere else. Oh, uh, you guys are... <laughs> That reminds me, it wouldn't be a hen party without matching teachers. There's only four. What about the rest of the girls? They've got theirs. Come, let's take a pic, put it on Insta, hashtag hen party, hashtag black girl power. <laughs> I'm not wearing that. What's wrong with it? There's not much to it. I know, that's why I love it. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help me. Let us pray. Oh, ain't nobody got time for that. Besides, you can just pray for forgiveness later. Anyway, what made you decide on getting married in Spain? You know, we just wanted something about us. Something cosy and intimate. Oh, that's, oh, that's so nice. So romantic. Yeah. A little Eurocentric anyway, if you ask me. Marriage is supposed to bring families together. Family's the root of African culture. I just couldn't imagine getting married without all my friends and family there. We live in Europe though, not Africa. Yeah, like, your wedding was like Africa with the drums and the library of shams. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I want something more classy. The registry and the community centre reception does not do it for me. Wait, you drank most of the wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that was there and I moved up in the world. Mmm, especially with your white Prince Charming. What happened to you? Asha? Whoa, everyone was thinking it anyway. He's not white, he's mum's mixed race. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Oh, here we go. It's always got to be about black and white with you. If you're rooting who you are, who you used to be, you'd know why. Are you trying to say that I'm less black or I'm not who I am because of who I'm marrying? You need to get Africated. Just because I didn't live in Jamaica like Levina, I'm not from Africa like you, does not mean I don't know who I am. Like, this is where I've been all my life. I plan to live and have my children here. I think you take the race sim too seriously. We're all God's children, the human family. So if you find an issue with it, you should leave here and go to the Caribbean or Africa. Yeah, well, I was just saying. Marriage does challenge your identity, especially us as women. I guess so. I, uh couldn't marry someone who wasn't the same as me. Sorry, what is that supposed to mean? Um, someone without Christian beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. What is funny? I thought this was meant to be a party, us having fun. Um, laugh where you want, because you're just as British and assimilated in this culture as myself. Speak for yourself. You're the one who's been assimilated by the culture. Truth or dare, anyone? Such was down you. Assimilation is, is a massive challenge in terms of identity development because we are constantly trying to find out who we are in relation to our age, our gender, our sexuality. Um, our racialization, you know, um, our cultural um, frameworks. We're constantly trying to make sense of that and feel confident in our identities. So the assimilation is a process that starts really, really young. You know, as soon as we're born, we're raised in some way that gives us messages about who we ought to be, who we are, um, and and um, how loved or hated we might be if we don't conform to the information that's given to us about what society expects of us. Yeah, in this climate, in this culture, in the UK, 
um, in Europe, in the West, you know, we are expected to conform to, to a white washing, if you like, um, you know, to being anglicised, westernised, uh, conforming to Western thought, Western behaviour, um, Western rules, and um, what I call black Western archetypes, um, which are often the negative ways that we've thought about. Your culture develops either uh, in rebellion to the oppressive culture or in assimilation with the oppressive culture. And these things happen at the same time, yeah? They're not mutually exclusive. Um, and so what happens is in, in, in your acts of resistance, you produce brilliance, yeah? Um, we as African people have magnificent resilience in the sense of whatever the context, how, however much you've been oppressed, we've, we've always been able to produce from the best of ourselves. You're, you're vulnerable in, term, in, in the sense of um, trying to conform and fit in the whole time. you constantly trying to blend in uh, to a, a, um, something that you cannot blend yourself into. Yeah. So that does affect your development because you're not um, just living, you're not just expressing, you're actually just playing catch up the whole time. Um, to try and fit in and, and blend in, and therefore you're less than who you are all the time. Um, I, I think one of the most important things about being a person, being a, a fully developed, mature person, is actually having a sense of who you are. I think when you don't know who you are, then you become susceptible to every whim, every fashion, every policy, every idea out there, and not knowing what's good for you and what's bad for you. I would even boil it down to the parents, because we are coming from a narrative, isn't it? We as African people is coming from a narrative. And our narrative said that it take a village to raise the child. So when we come in with Wazungu argument at all about single father and single mother, and him, he might talk about himself. When he used to lock up female woman in a chastity belt and go go tea for the people things. You know, and we run with that whole narrative. You understand what I'm saying that? We are a child of our community from the womb to the tomb. You understand? So if a child is behaving rough out there and we see that, it's our own investment and we have to try to put it right, put that child right. But we can't just blame the parents, the parents, the parents, because that is what they do to us. And we are run with the same thing. You know, we are run with the same thing. Oh, it's single mother. It? No, no, no. It take a village to raise a child. You understand? And we are, we are living in a country. We, oh, every day they get up, they get up to destroy the family. So if you destroy the family, you will destroy the village. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens, is the family is under attack. It has nothing to do with single mother and single father. It's to do with the family. For interruption of enslavement and also our experience in emerging from our enslavement to create a new identity. That means that for us redefining ourselves, including our name, how do we see ourselves? African, black, British, all these things. We as a community have to somehow find that strength, find that capacity to do that. And it, it is being done. I see groups, I see individuals who are taking on that responsibility because it's not going to happen by magic. It's not going to happen by some type of hoping and believing it's going to happen. In my early teens, being told I was Afro-Caribbean. Yeah, that was the way we were classified then. Now, this Afro thing, I never really understood, you know, because I know it's to do with our hair, a hairstyle, as it were, or a type of hair. Um, but that's how it was at the time. And so the link, e even then, there was this clear link with Africa. That was what the Afro bit was meant to symbolise. And then the Caribbean. But then, say, around the, what? late 80s 90s it began to change and then within the the way in which we recorded in the national censuses you, we were no longer afro-caribbean it then became you were black african or you were black caribbean and that is how it is to this day i, I am constantly trying to you know advocate for the we and the we wearing black women of the uk they say, because we wear weed, 
we are less black than the other women who don't have weeds, who may have locks, may have afros, the old, na old natural na afros. That doesn't make me less a black woman than what you are. Listen, I love my we I love my the, the diversity of me manipulating my looks. Why are you why? Why did I do that? Please, somebody explain to me. I see my grandmama, she got wigs. Yeah. She don't know she don't know, know about lace wigs yet, yeah? But hello, it's your money. This listen, I remember about, you know, like twenty years ago. Weave is us. Weave, you know the tracks. Is now I learned that ten years later, you see Victoria Beckham move like Hello <laughs> And now you see the hormones of Kardashian shit. I am over it. Embrace your diversity in your hair, your hue, and who you are. You understand? I don't get it. I'm confused. Stop. Black Britain's collective contributions to the legacy, strength, and vibrancy of Britain is hardly recognised. And living in an environment paved with many forms of discrimination and oppression and has its challenges. So how does racism, negative stereotypes, influence one's self-concept on a day-to-day -day basis? What do you tell your children? How do you walk? How does that affect how you talk? How you interact with others? The person who went to the colonies and encouraged the people to come here to work for jobs that our people wouldn't do was a certain Enoch Powell when he was the Minister of Health in 1960. for about 10 years before you get a passport. Well, can I ask you another question? Yeah, Care for Mr. Bonson? You're full of these, this misinformation. Mm. Amos, oh, right, please? Well, you a question. You're yeah, no problem, my friend. Get on. Useful, isn't it? No, I may, so. ask, yeah. may I ask you a question? How long has this point system been in place? Uh, for about 10 years. Has it? Yeah. Well, um, the thing I don't understand is that every Sorry, time mate. It's going to take a bit of time with the traffic. It's a bit heavy today. Apologies for that. Is that okay? That's no problem. But the guy who mentioned Nigerian people living in his area. Yes. The thing that astonishes me is that you would attack him as a racist because he happened to mention he had Nigerian people living in his area. Now, if every time we have a discussion on immigration, it, people are going to be accused of being racist. Because, because, the, color, the, the, color the, the, because the color of the people is completely immaterial. Where are you from then, pal? The are you cross? No, no, where are you people from? You're people. I was born here, but my parents are from Jamaica. Right, Jamaica, yeah. about immigration. It tells me that on the screen here. Indeed, I am. Someone has been uh, arrested by police and the two knives have been found nearby. Now, oh. now the location of this is they want right anger. in the center of the They just Westminster. want anger. It's, it's despicable um, what they're doing. Just um, near uh, Parliament Square. It's terrorists. Down Whitehall, so just on the Bombing and stabbing, running up and down the streets, causing all sorts of havoc. Now the black boys are joining in. All terrorists are vile, but I don't see what colour has to do with any of it. But it's sad, and the film, I feel for their families. With me tonight, you wouldn't have got this years ago. These, these people yeah. don't want to be English. Half of them don't even speak English. Just look at the road. Just look at the traffic. Just look at the sh shops. Just look at the uh, houses. Look at the old estates. Oh, I don't know where this country is coming to. I'm just sick and tired of it. And it's not just me. There's a lot of people sick and tired of what's going on in this country. Are well, you saying that we should just get rid of all immigrants and just chuck them out? That'd be a good start. Is that all immigrants or immigrants of colour? That's all immigrants. The colour's got nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. So I take my British birth certificate and my British passport and I go where? Wherever you want, wherever you like. I don't care. If you kick everyone out, then you're not going to have a great Britain. I'm telling you, it's going to kick off big time. One more, one more terrorist attack in this country and it's going to kick off big. It ain't going to be small, it's going to be big. It's terrible. It wasn't a terrorist attack, it was just a madman running down people outside Parliament. Media sensationalizes this type of thing all the time, especially when the guys look like me. 
No, 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 you're warning me, aren't you? It's not, not the media. The media didn't cause 7 7. The media didn't cause Ma Manchester or Westminster or London Bridge. And they certainly didn't cause them poor chaps, that poor soldiers heading in Woolwich Wool to get cut off. And they didn't start all the riots. Everything that you know about those events is from the media. I, I know what I know. And then they never lie at that. I know what I know. Don't you? I'm talking here. I know what I know. I understand what I understand. I've learned through life. I've learned through my eyes. I've lived a life and I know exactly what I know. So British Empire colonised and extracted wealth out of half of the world's nations. Yeah, boosting the economy here and making living conditions in those countries harder. And people just followed the wealth to Britain. Furthermore, many of these nations are part of the Commonwealth. British citizens and subjects living in other countries. This immigration nonsense is just to distract and make the working people divided. Whilst they just laugh their way all the way to the bank, just think about it. Look, mate, I think you've got a, a serious chip on your shoulder and you need to forgive and forget. This was a long time ago, you know. Anyway, his aim was right. I'm sure I ate. No, it's all right, just get out. You know, when you say that, you know, there's too many black people over this country. I'm not racist myself, because I, you know, I've got some friends who are black, you know? But there's too many black people in this yeah, country. That's right, yeah. That's where, exactly, where exactly, Peter, are you going to be a Conservative councillor? I don't know yet. Most people who are black or identify as black, or don't even identify as black, but come from an African heritage um, identity or cultural background, um, will have at some point in their lives, if they're based in the UK or Europe, experienced the impact of racism, either indirectly or directly. Um, so in my work, I bear that in mind. Yeah, if I ignore that, I'm ignoring their identity and the impact of socialization on their identity and the impact of assimilation processes on their identity, the expectation that because they're in a European um, culture that they will behave as white people do. Um, there is a direct link between how we identify ourselves or our lack of identification and the problems that we face economically, politically and socially, whether, it, whether, it come, whether, it, whether it's employment, whether it's underachievement in education, whether it's mental health, whether, especially mental health, um, if we understand that the extent to which being mentally well has to do with your idea of, or sense of self. Yeah, what you see as yourself, yeah? Um, and even socially in terms of the quote unquote gang violence, yeah? And I hate to use that word because that's another word that's been imposed upon us, but that's what they call it. Um, gang violence and that kind of things. If we, at every point there's been a movement of black people, for black people, violence within the black community is a problem that is on the decline or almost solved, yeah? So there's a direct link between the extent to which we know who we are and have a collective identity and the extent to which we fight against each other. And ask. A lot of people live in kind of like a dual identity because of being under a, an oppressive system. You feel like you have to put on another face when you go into these institutions, yeah. whether that's work, whether that's school. So a lot of people are having a lot of psychological damage because you know they don't feel like they can be themselves. Mm. And that's really different from what you said about being made to feel that you know your true self is ugly, whether that's your looks, the way that you speak. Yeah. You know, the, I could go on about countless stories where people have kind of been in situations where um, you're, you're made a, a mockery or people want you to perform for them yeah, as yes. a black person. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't fit into this kind of shape, this mould of, of what they expect. And they, they, you know, I'm sure everyone here has had someone, you know, come up to them and go, oh, well, go on, yeah. or whatever. And <laughs> even, if you don't, even if you don't speak like that, and yeah. you're just like, you know, and, and that is damaging because, it, you know, you're in these environments where often you're the minority as well. See, I had my hair back and um, if, for example, if I walk, I guarantee you, if I walk along this Peckham Street right now, someone will ask me, oh, do you want to do your hair? Yeah. And I look at them like, this is a choice, you know, and I actually chose to wrap my hair. Like, it's, it's, it's crazy because the oppression we face um, in this society where we live is not, it's from every angle. It's not only economic, 
it's not just uh, through employment, it's through education, it's um, through, through finance as well. And it's, it's like, there's a lot of, there's a rhetoric of, um, you could do what you want to do, but tone it down. Yeah. Whether that's in your dressing, tone it down. Mm -hmm. Whether that's in your hairstyle, tone it down. Loudness, tone it down. It's just like everything about us, we're told to simmer down. Mm -hmm. And whereas other people could do it as loud as they want, like, for example, if you, like when white people go out and get drunk, they could be as loud as they want, mm -hmm. and they don't have to worry about, oh, but, you know, we're, we're, we're white, so, you know, <laughs> people are going to say this about us. But as blacks, we've got to be like, shh, because, you know, they'll say we're black. Mm -hmm. So it's something that everyone knows, and it's something that has been, um, is, is, is carried on so long that now we've just taken it upon ourselves to now make sure that it's our responsibility to tone ourselves down. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, well, you knew you weren't going to get that job because look at your hair. And it's just like, well, why should, why should I accept that? When you uh, adhere to the system of oppression, which is dictating to you that your very state of being is the worst part. The very state of being is uncivilized because that's essentially another word of being unprofessional. It means you're not civilized. You can't conduct yourself in a place of work probably based on the way you naturally look mm -hmm. there's um you know our, our african sisters who go on the journey of of the, the the natural journey like the fact that it's called natural hair europeans don't call their hair natural hair nobody no other race actually calls it natural hair. Just hair the fact that if they do have an afro what are you some black panther or like those are the first automatic thoughts that is political, it's political and we can attach that to black being a, the thing of a struggle so that even you being who you are there's not this i just want to be myself like this is who i was born like mm. the fact that you're just being that makes you political goes to show mm. the levels the great degree degree of levels of, uh, and, and the, the the force that is against us just just being. Well, understanding and appreciating that um, we as a people over the last 2,000 years have been a people who have been just destroyed. Um, our, our kingdoms, our cities, our countries have been invaded, have been totally um, destroyed and decimated and so have we. Our language, our culture and everything has been taken away from us and we are now just in a position where we have are able to find ourselves and begin to rebuild and it's going to take time a lot of time before we can get to where ideally we were in the past or from where we want to be in the future um, and just to appreciate as a people that we're all coming from a, a, a really dark place and we're on a journey but you know we will be great again <laughs> I remember I'm a very old lady irrespective of what the camera might say but Gentrification, right, I swear to God, has impacted on our blackness. I remember when my, I used to go to Brixton with my mother, and it was all, Mr. Martin, all these black stores were open, no longer. In uh, um, Grenville Arcade, I don't know what they call it now, it's all restaurants, these bougie restaurants, queues out, queues, queues everywhere. When they asked, when Mr. Martin, back in the um, 80s and 90s, asked for extension to sell their hair, hair products to 7 o'clock, it was denied. It was denied. But hold on. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Brixton Market is open to what? 1 o'clock? Why? Why? What? Is the black money different from the white money? Black money different from the white money? No, it ain't. And we spend more. We spend more. We, they want to spend The indigenous people, when Brixton was a ghetto, and they, a black, yeah, let's use that word, a black ghetto, no one wanted to come around there. Now, I'm you in my shot. Because this is important. As future generations continue this journey in the UK, can the various black and African heritage communities create a unified identity or is assimilation inevitable? As most only know the British experience. Is that our destiny to assimilate, to water ourselves down? I'm part of uh, something called the Global African People's Parliament. And we have studied this issue and we have been working to, if you like, a 10, 15 year plan that looks at how are we gonna grapple with 
this situation? How can we repair ourselves uh, at the same time as, you know, recognizing that not everyone will want to up, up and go to Africa or even to the Caribbean, but yet they might, you know, they've got families here, they've settled here, they've got children here, because even if parents want to do it, they're worried about their children and sometimes their children might not want to follow them. Yeah, so we've come up with this notion of the African heritage community for national self-determination. And what that is, it's a model of community development and building that recognises that out of many communities, we have to form one, one African community. So we can't just wait till we go to Africa to have this model pan-Africanism. We have to start inculcating that, living that here. Yeah. And it is tied to repatriation and what we call rematriation, which is where we actually um, reconnect with our motherland ancestrally, culturally, spiritually, in terms of our knowledge systems. It's not just a physical return. It's also a cultural and spiritual return first. Darkness, the darkness. I think a lot of us as black people, we need to we need to get back into a kind of dark room and develop ourselves. You understand? Because we're white out of our mind. You understand? Now we do, and we can't see the self eat. Because the self eat just creep up on a lot, lot of us, you know. Even Virgin and Sixteen West of the on in Liberation Road. It's a self eat in a certain way. You know, see it, you know. And this is what we have to come together, you know, see it, and show the next generation that we're proud of who we are. You understand, you know? And we are not afraid to express ourselves. And we should not wait until others pay us to express ourselves. You understand? Because if we if we continue to live like that, then it's just like slave I will live like that. So identity is key to who we are. And I think that if I want to say anything, is the idea of recognizing ourselves as Africans, no matter where we are in the world, means that we recognize that we're not alone that there is a billion of us on this planet. And we are a global force that is one to be reckoned. We are creative, spiritual, loving. Uh, we have a fantastic tradition of uh, arts, of justice, of fairness, and all the things that we see in the media that kind of shows us of pot bellies, flies, uh, incapable of self-determining are myths. For me, blackness, Africanness, it's not about the clothes that I'm wearing, it's not about the way I dress my hair. It comes from within, it comes from my spirit. It comes from a knowing, you know, that can't necessarily be articulated in words. Like it's imperative, yeah, that we as a African people understand, yeah, that we are all one. Haiti, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, wherever you're from, yeah, we're all one, yeah. It, it, it was, the man's game plan to spread us all over this planet and not know ourselves and his plan has worked. It's priority for us to start rooting back to Africa um, and connecting with the source um, so that we can break the chains. If we don't do that, what will end up happening is we continue to be um, vulnerable to the oppression of the system because we're s still left separate. And the important thing is that we choose how we want to identify and that we understand the cultural connotations of using that term if we want to use it. Um, I don't think anyone should be told how to identify themselves but I think everyone should be assisted to accept, understand and embrace their African heritage as, as part of their um, intergenerational well-being. But most importantly, we have to reinforce our culture from a positively affirming place rather than a negative one. So, it, so we're not doing this because we're oppressed. We're doing this because we are proud of who we are. It has to be positive affirming. We have to, be, we have to know what we're for before we know what we're against. So to know that we're doing this consciously because we're trying to reunify our people, we try to better our people, and we understand the role that having a unified identity plays in us being able to achieve that goal. It's important because identity is not just 
a personal issue. It's a social issue as it is woven into the fabric of group existence and prosperity. A healthy, solid sense of identity leads to strong individuals, strong families, and thus strong nations. My identity has not been known since my birth, for it was my ancestors who were dispersed to the furthest reaches of this earth. To call me black, please don't say I'm of a darker hue. Based on my blackness, what does that make me to you? Three-fifths, a Negro, now an ethnic minority, that's all based on the status of a European story. Some say that they're black, some say that they're not, some say they're West Indian, some claim that they're lost. Me, I'm a man and that's all I can be. Based on these shades of my own identity, it makes us who we are and where we stand and what we need to know. But all I know, I'm a black man from the Caribbean, but Africa's my home. Living in a world where our identity scattered and where we live and our interior feelings don't really matter. They make names for us, cards, and however we feel. But all I know when it comes to my identity, I try to stay real. Research your past and know the life that you're living. And then maybe your identity will come through and knowledge will be given. It's a sign of the times, so make a stand. Because to be known, it's your identity that will make you a real man. That's all I got, brother. That's all I got, brother.